And turn, if you will, to 1 Timothy chapter 2. 1 Timothy chapter 2. We're thinking this morning on the principles of prayer. The principles of prayer. While you're turning, let me say that I believe when we get to heaven, the thing that is going to amaze us, among other things that we'll see, is that we prayed so little and so poorly while we were here on earth. And I want to tell you the thing that amazes God while God is in heaven right now is that we do not pray. The Bible says that God wondered that there was no intercessor. And the Bible says that when Jesus Christ was here on earth, he looked around at those who were surrounding him, and the Bible says that he marveled at their unbelief. God looks down from heaven, and God just wonders that we don't pray more. It's perplexing to God why Adrian Rogers and the people of Bellevue don't pray more than they do. And Jesus Christ looked around, and Jesus just marveled that men did not believe in God more than they believe in God. And I tell you what amazes God amuses Satan. Satan laughs. Satan mocks at our toiling. Satan ridicules our plans and our schemes, but Satan fears our prayers. Bellevue Baptist Church, in order to be the church that Jesus Christ wants it to be, must be a praying church. We must learn to pray. There is no substitute for prayer. Not intellect, not enthusiasm, not uh, plans, not pep, not paraphernalia, not program, but prayer. We must learn to pray. The average church, the modern church, the average Christian, the modern Christian has substituted everything that he can for prayer. And when we depend upon our enthusiasm, we get what our enthusiasm can do. And when we depend upon our intellect, we get what our intellect can do. But when we depend upon prayer, we get what God can do, and there is a vast difference. What a shame that so many churches today have substituted organizing for agonizing and program for prayer. I am not against organization. I am not against program, but all is vain unless the Spirit of the Holy One comes down. And God wants to teach us how to pray. Having said that, listen to the Scripture. 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 1. I exhort, therefore, that first of all, supplications, prayers, intercessions, and giving of thanks be made for all men, for kings, and for all that are in authority, that we may live a quiet and peaceable life in all godliness and honesty, for this is good and acceptable in the sight of God our Savior, who will have all men to be saved and to come into the knowledge of the truth. For there is one God and one mediator between God and man, and men, rather, the man Christ Jesus, who gave himself a ransom for all to be testified in due time. For this I am ordained a preacher and an apostle. I speak the truth in Christ and lie not, a teacher of the Gentiles in faith and verity. I will, therefore, that men pray everywhere, lifting up holy hands without wrath and doubting. Now, with that scripture before you, I want you to notice several things about prayer. The first thing I want you to notice is the demand that we pray. I exhort, therefore, first of all, Paul says, that men pray. We are to pray. Look again at this passage of Scripture. Chapter 2, verse 1, I exhort, therefore, that first of all, supplications, prayers, intercessions, and giving of thanks be made for all men. Paul says, number one, first of all, before you do anything else, pray. We can do more than pray after we have prayed. But we cannot do more than pray until we have prayed. First of all, prayer. First of all, prayer. Oh, dear friend, how we sin against God when we do not pray. Samuel said, God forbid that I should sin against the Lord in ceasing to pray for you. Why should Christians pray? It is commanded of God. The Bible tells us that we ought to pray. Luke 18, verse 1, And he spake a parable unto them to this end, that men ought always to pray and not to faint. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 17, the Bible injunction is, Pray without ceasing. 
nothing. And in Philippians chapter 4 and verse 6, the Bible says, Be careful for nothing. That is, don't worry about anything. But in everything by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known unto God, and the peace of God that passeth all understanding shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Why pray? Because God has said that we ought to pray. And prayer is the way that God wants to bless you. God's Word declares in James chapter 4 and verse 2, You have not because you ask not. How many blessings God has that are up in heaven getting mildew? How many blessings God has that are up in heaven getting rusty? Because you have not asked. Oh, how many times God has wanted to bless, but you wouldn't pray. How many times God has wanted to load you with benefits, but you would not pray. Oh, you thought you'd do it your own way. You, we fight, we war, we scheme, we connive, we plan. We do everything but pray. And we have not because we ask not. I may have told some of you the story of the time I was in Florida working my way through college, staying in a little garage apartment. Joyce and I were uh, eating our lunch one day, and I looked down in the backyard of that apartment, and we had several trees there. There was a sweet orange tree and a tangerine tree and a grapefruit tree and a sour orange tree. Now, if you're not from Florida, you may not know what a sour orange is, but, brother, they name it a sour orange for a good reason. One bite will give anybody lockjaw. It's an amazing thing. A beautiful orange, but sour and three times sour. And I watched, and all the other fruit had been taken from the trees and picked, but the sour orange tree, of course, had been neglected. And I saw a little tyke in our backyard uh, sneaking around the garage there, and I wondered, now what's wrong with that fellow? Why is he being so secretive? And then I saw what he was up to. He was about to steal an orange. Well, that amazed me because he was looking this way and that way to make sure no one was looking. Of course, I was looking. And you know, God is watching us, isn't he? Always from his garage apartment. And, and so I was looking. I was watching. And he forgot to look up like so many of us do when we sneak around wanting to get something some other way than God's way. And I watched him as he got hold of a leaf and pulled it down and got hold of a twig and pulled it down and got hold of a limb and pulled that down and got hold of a big orange, a sour orange and made off with it. I didn't have much money at that time, but I believe I would have given a dollar to see him take the first bite, and he took off with that orange. Now, the amazing thing is this, that I had in my closet upstairs several huge sacks of oranges. I mean, just great big sacks full of the sweetest oranges you've ever seen. A deacon had given them to me in my little country church, and I said, well, Mr. Ingram, I can't eat all those oranges. He said, I know it, but take them and give them away to the people at school. Now, suppose that little fella had come and knocked on my door and said, Mr., can I have one of those oranges down there? I'd have said, son, you don't want those oranges. They're sour. But if you want some oranges, just let's get a bag here. I've got more than I can use, you know, and I'd have given him all he wanted. I wonder how many times you've taken the devil's sour orange when you could have had God's blessing. I wonder how many times we simply do not have because we go about to get things our own way rather than God's way. You have not because you ask not. Oh, friend, we ought to pray because God has commanded that we pray. We ought to pray because it's God's way to see to it that you get what you need. God is not poor. God is not broke. Everything you need, my God can supply through his riches and glory by Christ Jesus. And I want to say you ought to pray because that's the way to be happy. Oh, you receive fullness of joy when you learn how to pray powerfully. The Bible says in John chapter 16, verse 24, Jesus is speaking, Hitherto have ye asked, any, hitherto have ye asked nothing in my name. Ask and ye shall receive that your joy may be full. You show me an unhappy Christian, I'll show you a Christian who hasn't learned how to pray. You show me a person who learns how to pray, really pray, and I'll show you a happy Christian. God doesn't want his people to be sad and defeated and unhappy. Prayer is the way to be happy. Jesus said, ask and you shall receive that your joy may be full. And I want to say, dear friend, that prayer conversely then is the cure for every worry. All oh, these Christians that go around looking so defeated and so discouraged, they look like an advanced agent for the undertaker to me with a Bible under one arm and a tombstone under the other. Here they come. Bad news. They look like an accident going somewhere to happen. What's wrong with these people? 
They must know nothing about prayer. For the Bible says in, first, in Philippians chapter 4, verse 6, Be careful for nothing. That is, don't worry about anything. But in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known unto God. And the peace of God that passeth all understanding shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus our Lord. Oh, the first thing I want you to notice in this passage of Scripture is the demand to pray. I exhort, therefore, that first of all, supplications, prayers, intercessions, and giving of thanks be made for all men. Now, the second thing I want you to notice is not only the demands of prayer, but I want you to notice the description of prayer. We're in 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 1. I exhort, therefore, that first of all, and now he describes prayer under four terms. First of all, supplications, prayers, intercessions, and giving of thanks be made for all men. Now, this is not only the demand that we pray, but is also the description of the kind of praying that we do. And the first we see is supplication. Now, this word supplication uh, literally means petition. It means to ask of God that which we need, and God will give it to us. If you need something, ask God. Make it definite. Tell the Lord what you want. You know, an overworked word in our prayer is bless. Lord, bless the church. Lord, bless the lost. Lord, bless the saved. And we just simply say bless. But we don't make it definite. We don't make it specific. Our prayers are so general, if God were to answer them, we would never really be sure that he has uh, answered them. When you're praying the prayer of supplication or petition, make it specific so that when God answers your prayer, you'll know it. And remember that no matter is too small for you to pray about. If it's important to you, it is important to God. The Bible says we're to pray about everything in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving. Let your request be made known unto God. And then I, I, as you ask in petition, remember that God will answer personal prayers, but God doesn't answer selfish prayers. Don't be like the man who prayed, God bless me and my wife Mavis and Edna and our parakeet Avis, us four no more, amen. Don't be like that man. Pray for others. We're going to see your petitionary prayer ought to be not a selfish prayer. The Bible goes on to say in the book of James chapter 4 verse 2, you have not because you ask not, and you ask and receive not because you ask amiss, that you might consume it upon your lust. Ye adulterers and adulteresses, know ye not that uh, friendship with the world is enmity with God? So God's not going to answer selfish, carnal prayers for you, but he will answer personal prayers. If you have a need, your Heavenly Father knows that you have a need. And he's willing to give you your daily bread. He's willing to give you your clothes. He's willing to give you your job. He is willing to give you all that pertains to life and godliness if you will ask. This is the prayer of petition. Now there's another word here as prayer is described. He says, first of all, supplications. Now the next word that is mentioned in chapter 2, verse 1, is the word prayer. Now, this word is very closely linked to our English word communion. It doesn't just simply mean all prayer, but translated, it speaks of the kind of prayer that likes to be alone with God, just to love God. You know, when I was dating Joyce, somehow I found the time to get her off by herself in a secluded place, in a quiet place, because I wanted to be near her, and I wanted just to be near her and her alone. Jesus said, when you pray, enter into your closet and shut the door, and your Father, which sees in secret, shall reward thee openly. Find a quiet time. Find a definite time. Find a secluded place. Get alone with God and just simply love him. Look into the face of God and praise him. Don't have so many give me prayers, but find a time when you can just commune with the Lord Jesus Christ. A little girl was upstairs in her bedroom for a long, long time. Finally, she came down and her daddy asked her, said, sweetheart, where have you been? And she said, well, I've been praying. He said, well, what could a little girl like you have to pray about so long? Oh, she said, I, I don't know. She said, I was just telling Jesus that I love him. He was telling me that he loves me, and we were just loving one another. Well, you know, we need to do that. We need to get alone with the Lord and just say, Jesus, I love you, and, and to read his word and to meditate upon his goodness. Prayer is petition, and then prayer is communion, and then prayer is intercession. Look, I exhort, therefore, that first of all, supplications, prayers, the third word now, is intercessions. 
And this, of course, is the prayer on the behalf of other people. It'll be a great day, a glorious day in my life and yours and in the life of this church when we learn to pray the powerful prayers of intercession. Dear friend, when we start to pray these intercessory prayers for our lost friends, things start to happen to them. I was reading a long time ago a story that Dr. Harry Ironside told about Sam Hadley. Sam Hadley was a converted alcoholic. God saved him, and God saved him good. And because God had saved him in such a wonderful way, Sam Hadley went around in great auditoriums and gave his testimony. And God used Sam Hadley's testimony. Sam Hadley was in Detroit, Michigan. And while he was in Detroit, he was traveling on a train, and when the train stopped, he went down to a little rescue mission and gave his testimony. There was in that rescue mission that night an old man and an old woman who came up to Sam Hadley and said, Sir, you must come home and have supper with us. Oh, he said, I must not. I cannot. My body is weak and tired. I, I shouldn't even have been speaking, and I must speak in Oakland, California. They said, We know you're going to speak in Oakland, but said there is a specific reason. You must come and eat with us. And so he said, well, if you'll let me lie down for a few minutes, I will. Sam Hadley took his rest, went home with this little couple there in their very quaint home. And after a supper, the best she could prepare, she said to him, Mr. Hadley, let us tell you the burden on our heart. We have a son, an only son. We thought we raised him right. We raised him in church. We raised him in Sunday school. But he had to go to work when he was a very young boy. And he got in with the wrong crowd. A group of coarse, rough men, drinking men. Our son started to drink. It broke our hearts the first night he came home drunk. Then he started staying out later and later, and then he would stay out all nights, and we wouldn't know where he was. And finally, our son came home one morning after having been out all night and said, Mom and Dad, while I was drunk, I did something that if it is found out and uncovered, it will not go well with me, and I must leave. I will not stay here and disgrace you folks. And he packed up his belongings, and he left our home. And they said, Mr. Hadley, we've not seen or heard of our son since. It's been years. We have presumed that perhaps he was dead. But the other day, someone in San Francisco said they saw our son Jim as they were passing by on a streetcar. They looked out the window for just a moment. They said, it is Jim. It is Jim. We know it to be Jim. They got off the streetcar and went back, but he'd already boarded another car. They wrote us and told us about it. And now they said, Mr. Hadley, you're here, and you're going to be there. And we don't think that it is a mere coincidence. We have been praying the prayer of faith and the prayer of intercession that God will use you to win our son Jim while you're there in Oakland. He said, well, madam, it's a big city, and I don't even know your son. They said, but we're going to pray, and God is going to do it. And before Sam Hadley left that home that day, they made him promise that each day between now and the time that he spoke that he would get on his knees at a certain hour, the same hour that they would be praying in Detroit and pray for Jim. Sam Hadley said he promised to do it. He went on to Oakland, California, and to San Francisco, to the Bay Area. They were getting ready for the service, and they did it a strange way. About midnight, they started a parade, and they went up and down the streets, about a thousand people wending their way through the streets of that city, singing praise to God. That's a good way to get a crowd, I suppose. We've never tried it. You want to try it one day, we'll do it. And they, they went up and down the streets of that city, and then finally came in and filled a big theater downtown. And it was packed. And all of the galleries, all the balconies were packed, and the ground floor was packed. Sam Hadley got up, ready to speak. And there was a man who came to a side door, and he, he, couldn't, uh, he couldn't get in. And so he came to the wings of the stage, and he couldn't get there. And he came closer, and he couldn't get in. He couldn't hear, and he, he kept listening. He kept getting closer. Finally, Wilbur Chapman saw the man, got up and, and brought him, and set him down in the chair where Sam Hadley had been speaking, uh, where he'd been sitting. Sam Hadley told of the marvelous grace of Jesus, went and sat down in the chair right next to where this man was sitting. Of course, you know who the man was. It only took uh, Sam Hadley and, and uh, Jim a few moments before Sam Hadley discovered that the very man he'd been praying for and interceding for was sitting next to him in that chair. He said, I was in a tavern when I saw the crowd go by. I went out and joined them. I tried to get in the building, and the policeman said, you can't get in. He said, I went around to the back, and he said, I went to the wings of the stage, and finally a man sat me down right here. 
And there in that theater, he found Jesus Christ as his blessed Savior and Lord. I say we need to learn how to pray the prayer of intercession. Oh, the prayer of intercession. You see, in petition, God does something for us. In communion, God does something in us. In intercession, God does something through us. Oh, and God wants to do something for us. And God wants to do something in us. And God wants to do something through us. But he can't do any of those things until we learn to pray. And then he goes on to describe prayer. I exhort, therefore, that first of all, supplications, prayers, intercessions, and giving of thanks. Now, if God has done something in us and through us and for us, we ought to thank God for it. You know what we need to do in some of our prayers? We need to pull out some of the groans and shove in a few hallelujahs. We need to thank God. We need to praise God. We need to lift our hands to the Lord and say, Bless the Lord, oh my soul and all that is within me. Bless his holy name. Bless the Lord, oh my soul, and forget not all his benefits. This is prayer described. Now, the next thing I want you to notice in this passage of Scripture is not only the demand and the duty to pray, and not only the description to pray, but I want you to notice, thirdly, the direction of our prayers. For whom should we pray? Notice what the Scripture says here in 2 Timothy chapter 2 as we continue. He says that supplications, prayers, intercessions, and giving of thanks be made for all men. And then he starts to elaborate on those for whom we ought to pray. And let me mention several classes of people that it is our duty, your duty and my duty, to intercede for, to pray for, to thank God for, and to make petitions for. First of all, for backslidden people. Now back up, uh, start in chapter 2, verse 1, and back up a little bit, just a moment. And look in chapter 1, verses 19 and 20 the two verses that go just before the exhortation to pray. Paul is telling Timothy that he is to be holding faith and a good conscience, which some, having put away concerning faith, have made shipwreck, of whom are Hymenaeus and Alexander, whom I have delivered unto Satan that they may learn not to blaspheme. Now, there were two in the church, one Hymenaeus, another Alexander, who had made shipwreck of their faith. Somehow they had gotten out of fellowship with God. Somehow they had become backsliders, and Paul mentions these two backsliders in chapter 1, and then he says in the beginning of chapter 2, I exhort therefore that we pray. Now what is the implication? The implication is that these men were backsliders somehow because the church did not pray for them. Or oh, how we ought to learn to pray for new Christians. How we ought to learn to pray for backsliders. Perhaps they fail because we do not pray. I wonder sometimes if a member of Bellevue gets out of fellowship with God and we argue with them or, or we condemn them or we ignore them and they continue to make their faith shipwreck, I wonder how much of it is our fault because we do not pray for them. Do you know a member of this church who ought to be here this morning? Is not here? You ought to pray for that person. Do you know a member of this church who's gone off in sin? You ought to pray for that person. Do you know a member of this church who's having doctrinal difficulties? You ought to bind Satan in their life and you ought to pray for that person. I tell you, there are multiplied thousands of people on the roll of Be Bellevue Baptist Church that need our prayers because their faith has been made shipwreck and we just simply write them off or maybe we ignore them or maybe we condemn them or maybe we criticize them but the Bible says ye which are strong restore such a one in the spirit of meekness considering thyself lest thou also be tempted oh we are to pray for the backslidden then he goes on to mention another category that we ought to pray for notice chapter 2 verse 2 for kings and for all that are in authority that we may lead a quiet and peaceable life and all godliness and honesty. That is, we are to pray for public officials. You're to pray for the mayor of Memphis. You're to pray for the president of the United States. 
how easy it is for us to sit around and make judgments about Watergate and to criticize. It doesn't take much size to criticize. I tell you, President Nixon had more people praying for him and fewer people criticizing him. Maybe he'd be a little easier for him to do the job that he's doing. I don't think there's a man, a woman, a boy, or a girl who can imagine the tremendous burdens upon the shoulder of this man. Right or wrong, he needs your prayers, and if he's wrong, he needs your prayers more than ever. Oh, how we need to pray for this man. How we need to hold him up. The Bible says righteousness exalteth a nation, but sin is a reproach to any people. Oh, I hear people say, well, we're not going to have any peace on this earth. Well, the Bible seems to indicate that if a nation will pray, that nation can know an episode of peace, and that nation can be like an island of peace in the midst of an ocean of war. For the Bible says if we pray for our leaders, we can live quiet and peaceable life in godliness and in honesty. We ought to pray for the backsliders. We ought to pray for public officials. And then we ought to pray for the unsaved. Continue to read in verse 3. For this is good and acceptable in the sight of God our Savior, who will have all men to be saved and to come unto the knowledge of the truth. We are to pray for all men. And we are to pray for the lost, that they might be saved. We don't come to church Sunday morning just simply to be edified and entertained. We know that as this message is going out, there are multiplied thousands of people who are listening to the Word of God as it's being preached over television, as it's being preached on the radio. But oh, we must baptize that Word in prayer, and we must hold those people up in prayer, and we must stand against Satan in their lives in prayer, and we must intercede for them. Oh, friends, let me tell you, your neighbors are...